and welcome to Future Up Close. Here we explore the topic of responsible innovation. Today we have Dr. Uh, Professor Dr. Armin Grunwald. Armin is a full professor of philosophy at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, in short KIT, based in Germany. There he is also the director of KIT's Institute for Technology As Assessment and Systems Analysis. Since 2002, Professor Dr. Grunwald has been serving as the director of the Office of Technology Assessment at the German, at the German Bundestag. So, also, hello and welcome. Hello and welcome. I was thinking about how to start our conversation. Why don't we start with a few grounding questions to provide our listeners with some context in regards to technology assessment and its connection with responsible innovation. Technology assessment is said to be one of the core roots of responsible innovation. So what is TA and how did it begin? Yeah, TA technology assessment was invented in the United States of America about 50 years ago in the rearm of the American Congress. So it was designed as an instrument for the parliament to get scientific knowledge for making better decisions. That is the basic uh, idea. And from that origin, TA spread first to Europe in the 1980s and 90s. And now we have a large variety of TA institutions, many parliaments in Europe, and increasingly also in uh, countries of other continents. So the basic idea is to look into science, into the scientific knowledge, and to make use of this knowledge for making better decisions in policy making. So it's about the influence of technology and later on also of innovation to all of the fields of policy making. It might be environmental policy, um, defense policy, um, uh, agricultural policy, whatever. And all of these policy fields are increasingly influenced by new technology. And in many, many cases, it's necessary to get knowledge of expected or feared or plausible or possible consequences of those new technologies as early as possible in order to take them into account into decision making. Were they, so I think when it comes to ethics and um, even things like sustainability today, there's a lot of awareness, but in order to trigger, say, government funding and action, it takes some push. Did something happen in Germany that helped to root technology assessment properly? Yes, the first was uh, its establishment in the United States. Yeah. Everything what happens in the United States of America creates awareness in Germany and also in many other countries of Europe. So that's quite normal um, for, for decades now. It was in the 1970s already. But later on, we had really some huge events. The first was our uh, problematic history with nuclear power. You know that there are that there were uh, demonstrations against nu nu nuclear power plants in the 1980s, 90s, and so on. Um, and a large part of the resistance, which still goes on, was oriented to the fact that while establishing nuclear power in Germany in the 1950s and 60s, nobody had taken care about how to dispose high-level nuclear waste. So the technology was taken into operation without an idea what to do, where to dispose, how to dispose this really problematic type of waste. And we are still struggling with this issue. Uh, this was a basic push to technology assessment because in TA, we try, we try to think um, all, through all the life cycles of te new technology, not only to look at the benefits earned at the beginning in the phase of operation, but also to look beyond and to take care what will happen with that technology, with the waste, 
after the phase of uh, having used it. Uh, so this was a very, very basic push at the beginning. Um, and the second one I would like to mention is the story of Stuttgart 21. Probably you don't know. Um, Stuttgart is one of the state uh, capitals in, in Germany. And the plan is to put the main station of the railway underground for several reasons to establish high speed train connections and so on. So a huge measure in the center of the city of Stuttgart. Uh, there was a planning process over 10 to 15 years. Uh, citizens had the opportunity to inform themselves and to give statements, but nothing happened. Everything remained silent. But as soon as the old main station got deconstructed, destroyed, and when trees were cut in its environment, then people started demonstrations, huge demonstrations. And the plan had to be postponed for years. And that was the, the signal that um, technology assessment must be done, and in particular, in cooperation with citizens, with stakeholders, with people affected and so on. So not just as an expert oriented TA, but together with those people who have to live with the new conditions. Okay. That's the third one, that's the third one, a bit different. It, um, it's about ethical issues of modern uh, biotechnologies, the GMO issue, but also life sciences in the, in the area of humans, the stem cell research uh, technologies at the beginning and end of life, where we had a lot of really um, well observed discussions also in the Bundestag with the high awareness in the public. And it was clear that technology assessment was needed also in this ethical respect. Oh, that's interesting. I'm wondering, so technology assessment originated in the 60s and then it progressed and spread across the world in the 80s with nanotechnology in the Netherlands and then just, um, just in general progressed. And now we have what we call responsible innovation. And I heard in one of your talks that you said there isn't really too much of a difference. <laughs> so I just want to um, ask you, what is the responsible innovation movement? Is there actual difference? And if so, what is it? What is the difference? Uh, first, it's interesting that also this idea of responsible innovation emerged in the United States of America. Yeah. It was, as far as I know, in the context of the National Nanotechnology Initiative started um, by Bill Clinton and Al Gore um, more than 20 years ago. So there was part of the budget dedicated to ethical research, to a kind of TA, to improve the opportunities to get really responsible innovation. And in the United States, there was a center of responsible nanotechnology at that time. And, and so, and from the United States, it went to Europe and it was taken up by the European Commission. Um, which coined this term of responsible research and innovation. And in fact, um, there are many rules of RI or RRI um, in TA. So for example, this idea of having an open future um, and we as humans today, we are uh, obliged to shape this future responsibly. Um, uh, there was an approach in TA called constructive technology assessment uh, developed by uh, colleagues from the Netherlands in, 19, uh, in the 1990s. I guess this was the predecessor of uh, RRI because this was TA not for parliaments or uh, ministries, but it was TA uh, for uh, the processes of the making of technology. So it led already to this stage of developing and making technology. And RI then uh, um, widened up the range, um, the range of, uh, of objects to be considered and addressees to be involved. Um, the main innovation of RI, I see in, in the extension to go to industry, to enterprises. 
FTA mostly addresses, addresses um, political bodies, public institutions, authorities, and so on. So these are all occupied with um, shaping the boundary conditions for technology development. Um, for example, um, promotion by public budget or regulation. But the makers of technology, they are mostly in industry, in the company. And the innovations, they emerge out of the technologies developed there. And so uh, RI extended the scope and went more to industry. And this is quite important, of course. And I welcomed this, uh, this widening uh, approach um, in the um, in the concepts and the basic ideas, it is very close to technology assessment. Yeah, to, to to gather all the knowledge we have in order to make some anticipations and foresight, to involve participation, to have a broader view on the issue under consideration, and so on. But this extension to industry that was new. Okay. Was there any? challenges. I'm assuming that the way that policymakers work and advising policymakers would be quite quite different with engaging the, the industry. Um, yeah, and this, going from one to the other. So it's not really going from one to the other, but it's more about involving both uh, both groups at the occasion of different questions. For example, the European Commission in this RRI uh, um, program, they often urged the consortia applying for funding to bring together science, enterprises, and policymakers and civil society. So this is a really this is really an integrative um, approach, bringing together people and groups and stakeholders from different directions in order to develop a broader view mm -hmm. and not only to go for, let me say, optimization in economic respect. Okay, I have a side question. So TA is starting in the US as a policy advisory tool, as you mentioned before, whereas Europe, Europe for me seemed to have taken TA, um, taken root, um, as a way to deal with a complexities of new information technology and its impact. So for me, TA in the US, at least in the early days, was more about power. I could be wrong, power. Whereas, whereas in the in Europe, it seems to be more about problem solving, and therefore it seems to have have had a much more enduring presence uh, today in terms of aiding policy making and innovation development. Is that understanding correct? Because uh, like you mentioned before, both TA and RI originated in the US, but it's not that present, they're not leading as much as Europe, European countries. This is a very, very interesting question, Xiaoan. Very interesting. And I guess it has something to do with the innovation culture. In the United States, there is a very strong entry, entrepreneurial um, innovation culture. Um, a small group of people can develop huge industries. We saw this in the development, in the fast development of the Silicon Valley uh, companies in the last decades. Um, while in Europe, innovation processes are more decentralized, more um, multicultural in a sense, yeah, uh, because Europe is very diverse in itself. And um, in Europe, there is more um, the, the, the relative significant significance of common good issues of uh, political dimension is, uh, is higher. So while, while in the uh, United States, it's more the neoliberal uh, idea that the companies will do best if they will not be disturbed by the state. In uh, most European states, uh, we say, well, companies are fine, but there must be some regulations of the market because the market alone will not be able to take care for, let me say, privacy for climate change and some of these big issues. Mm -hmm. And I guess 
in the TA in its policy advising form, parliament, parliamentary TA, for example, fits better to the European understanding of innovation. That might be the explanation for this movement. Okay, this is very interesting. I've been wondering about that for, um, for a while. And moving on to Australia. So it seems, it seems to me major change and disasters often played a key catalyst and trigger for developing TA and RI activities in different countries. So in my previous conversation with um, Professor Shalom Sresta, he mentioned that, for example, 2008 global financial crisis may have played a key role in, say, the Horizon 2020 project. So my question is, what can Australia learn from Germany to set ourselves up for success? Do we realistically need to experience some sort of innovation challenge, change uh, issue? in order for us to speed up our application of RI here in Australia? Um, the first lecture we can learn from the spreading of TA to, to many countries is that each country has its own culture of how to deal with new technology, uh, how innovations are created and disseminated, how technology is governed, um, how uh, the power, uh, the uh, balance of power is uh, guaranteed among uh, various actors and so on. So um, it's always an issue of finding, um, finding the best solution for that situation. There is no one fits all solution with regard to TA. So, but uh, it, instead it's, it always has to be adapted to the conditions at place in, in that country under consideration. And in this sense, I do not think that Germany could give some direct lessons to Australia, but Australia has to, uh, has to think itself about how to make it in an optimal way. I had uh, I made a visit to Brisbane, to the university and to CSIRO uh, last year. Um, and we talked a lot about um, RRI, and in particular in the Australian context, I also had a, a discussion with the um, former science chief science advisor of Australia. He was, for me, surprisingly, very, very interested in this parliamentary technology assessment uh, issue. Uh, but I guess it's more or less a kind of uh, searching uh, process um, where the best activities could be placed. Um, what, what, what has been proven um, purposive anyway is to have a kind of national network of uh, some people uh, who are interested in RRI and who cooperate at exchange ideas. Um, we founded a German network on TA in about, about 15 years ago. It works well. It has by annual conferences and so on. We have an own journal in German language uh, together with Austrian and uh, Swiss partners. And this idea of having a national network moved, migrated to Poland, uh, to Russia. And at the moment, in, there are some movements in China in this direction. So uh, this would be a good, a good infrastructure to, uh, to disseminate and to further develop the idea of RRI. It's so interesting. I would like to ask you about RRI in practice. What does a RRI project look like to you? I know it will be different depending on the type of project, um, who's involved and all those kind of things. I'm just trying to um, imagine a project in action from your perspective. What generally happens, who's generally is involved, um, whether you have an example to share with us. Um, yeah, an example. Perhaps let's look at the issue of care robots. So it's a bit, it is still a bit futuristic, uh, but there are already many stories about it. Mm -hmm. And there are developments towards having care robots in, in some future. Um, and um, 
Now, there are different approaches possible. The classical approach in, let me say, an old fashioned innovation system would be, well, some companies think about this, they cooperate with some scientific institutions, with robotics uh, institutes uh, and so on. And they think about, well, what could care homes and uh, people in care homes perhaps uh, like to have? And then they start developing processes, uh, develop prototypes and so on. And in the traditional way, they go to care homes only at a late stage of the development process. We had, in Germany, we had many experiences in the preceding field of AAL, ambient assisted living. Yeah. Uh, there, there, was, there was huge public budget spent into developed technologies uh, in this AAL uh, sense, um, for example, to allow older, older people to stay longer at home. Um, but these failed. They were technically wonderful, but at the very end, the market did not accept because these people, older people, they had different ideas than compared to, the, to those ideas the engineers had thought they would like to have. So and this is, an, um, I guess, a lesson to be learned um, to go to care homes, to talk to care personnel, to talk with their relatives, to talk to, to the people living in care homes as long as possible in order to, let me say, to develop a, de a requirement analysis. Now, what do they really want? Mm -hmm. And in that case, I guess there's a much better chance that after the development process, after the innovations are ready for market, that they then also will be accepted. So I guess this is, a kind of win-win situation. Yeah? The care homes and the older people, they will benefit from this because they will, make, will be able to make use of the new technologies. And also the companies will have a benefit because they will be able to, to sell their products. So that's good for both of, of these groups. This sounds very much like, uh, I, I used to work in marketing and this sounds like a, a very good benchmark for just research to understand your who you're designing the innovation for and to actually understand whether they would how they use something um, where they would use it what are the pain points they have it's a it's a quite similar to marketing research market research when we talk about going into the field and speaking with users yeah, in a sense, there's some relationship. Yes, you're right. Um, but it's more. Um, it's more. Uh, let me explain it at the occasion of some German experiences. Um, German scientists and engineers have been developing so many wonderful solutions over the last decade. But at the very end, it was there was no problem to be addressed by these solutions. Um, now you could say, okay, they did a wrong market uh, research, but it's more because market research is just asking people, making surveys is about getting some ideas from observing lifestyle patterns, developments, and so on, while RRI attempts to accept consumers, but also citizens and other people um, affected on equal footing. So it's not just to, to explore what they think, but to get into a dialogue with them. For example, in, in Germany, we, um, we developed the approach of real world lab research um, where, where we go to the citizens. Uh, we do not expect that they come to our campus. We go to them and uh, we talk to them. We might make a kind of co-development co-design of projects, for example, in the area of uh, sustainable development of urban quarters. So it's different from, uh, the, the roles are different. The roles are different. Uh, the, um, in market research, the consumers are the consumers. In RRI, the consumers are the partners. Okay. 
Is there a project that you've worked on that you thought this is fantastic? The process worked really well. Uh, do you have an example of that? Just like your your best practice project you've worked on. <laughs> um, uh, I come back to this issue of care homes. Yeah. We had a wonderful project three or four years ago um, with care homes who uh, for, for people with dementia. Mm -hmm. And so it was really a huge um, challenge to, to get uh, to get access to these care homes as a, as scientists to talk to the care persons to the relatives and in some times even with the with the uh, people with their dementia if possible and uh, we developed a requirement analysis what new which the new technologies could be useful to allow those people with dementia the largest extent of autonomy possible. Uh, this, if you, perhaps you know, um, dementia, it has its ups and downs. And um, the better a person is in order, the more autonomy can be given to this person. It, yeah. And so, it, it, so we, we, we thought about kind of uh, AI supported um, uh, surveillance technologies um, detecting the status of the persons and uh, giving them as much as as much as possible as much autonomy as possible um, adequate to that situation and now uh, my, our colleagues from the technical institutes at KIT they are developing this kind of technology so we are not yet in the state to say well it had wonderful impact and now all the care homes, they use it, but there is some optimism that this will be a very good story. Okay. Sounds really good. <laughs> so if just say, uh, I am a media science company, I'm doing something tremendously innovative and I'm ethically conscious. And I have a full team of engineers with me and I would like to make sure that my team is equipped to do TA or response innovation. Um, what should business leaders keep in mind when they choose experts or build teams um, to suit their innovation need? Can I just go and hire an ethicist to come on board? Uh, what, do, what do I need? Um, I guess, uh, first of all, and this holds for all the answers, it depends on, <laughs> it depends on the issue under consideration, on the context, on the market, and so on, and so on. On the economic sector, it's uh, always different. But to, uh, to, in order to try to give a more abstract answer, um, establish a cooperation with uh, TA or RRI Institute. I guess it's too, too narrow to engage an ethicist. This might be okay in some very specific cases in let me say biotech or life science or whatever. But in most cases, um, our responsible innovation is more an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary issue. So it needs of course, sometimes ethics or often it needs ethics, but it also needs an idea about the market, about uh, governance structures, about uh, involvement of uh, citizens, um, about participation, about how to organize some dialogue. This is more social science knowledge. So uh, I guess it needs a cooperation with institutes for which have uh, interdisciplinary competence in this field. And then it's better not to speak about scientific disciplines, but about the issue to be addressed. And depending on the issue and uh, depending on the target to be met, then you can um, identify and to determine which disciplines you need in order to fulfill the task. So I, I, I always put it in this way to, uh, to get the problem and the challenge clear first and then to look for 
the approach for method for persons for disciplines and so on. So in this really often it's a, a challenge to, um, to really cl clarify the issue. And this must be clarified not only from an economic point of view, but also from looking at the environment where the innovation shall put into, shall be put into. So in this environment is usually a social environment. Yeah, this may be a company in case of production plant, but often it's a kind of um, everyday life environment or it's a school environment or a care home as we had. And in all these environments, there are customs, there are uh, concerns, there are expectations, there are daily life routines. And all these should be taken into account when, when thinking about what would be a, a responsible innovation for this type of social environment. You know what it sounds like? And it's, I can be completely wrong, but it sounds like, you know, you know, during a film production, usually they don't have a locked in team. And what happens is that when they have a script, when they have the, the story ready, then they know how and what they need and what skill sets they need to have to build this production. And then they recruit people of the specific skills to come along and they kind of gather, they gather for a few months, they work on the project and then they go away. And what happens after that is uh, actually everybody, everybody works in a network and everyone kind of gets more skills than any, and over time you actually have lots of very equipped people, experts that um, have worked on multiple projects. So it's, it's, it's completely different um, field, but it sounds like the same structure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are, you are right. It's a very interesting um, association and a good analogy. Um, the issue is that in those fields, as you described, mm -hmm. this approach is, um, um, let me say, a kind of, it is self-evident, yeah, how to do it different. It is self-evident. But in um, innovation, and in particular in innovation close to science, it's not that evident. Because in the traditional approach, scientists and sometimes also the engineers in, in companies, they think, they thought to know about the social environment. They had their own ideas about the social environment and based on their own ideas, they started the development process and developed innovation. And then they, at least in Germany, they again and again got astonished to see, well, uh, this innovation does not fit. People did want to have something different. Um, so this is a change. Our responsible innovation uh, implies as an, an opening of uh, the innovation culture. Mm -hmm. And indeed is a good, a good hint to look at other um, practice fields where this uh, approach already is at place. Mm -hmm. I've never thought about the connection of the two until you said that before. Uh, I want to ask you something about the role of qualitative insights in driving innovation decisions. So it seems to me that the more complex and, and innovation is, the more that we need to rely on qualitative insights to better understand human behavior and how it shapes and changes innovation outcomes as a result. However, in practice, if we look at business spending, last year, about $80 billion was spent on market research and only 20% was spent on qualitative research. So engaging people, audience, to find out why they do certain things. Um, and I understand that this is due to a number of practical challenges, for example, time, cost, and difficulties in actually finding candidates to come and talk to you. So my question is, how can we make quality insights more accessible so that we can make more informed decisions? Um, mm. Perhaps better understand both the soft and hard impacts of, in of innovation. Mm. Yeah, it's a very good uh, and also difficult uh, question. Mm. Um, first of all, we need quantitative, quantitative um, models. We need data um, 
in order to understand systems. So that is quite clear. We cannot have all the issues in our mind and think about relationships and dependencies and uh, say free and independent variables and so on. We have really to do um, uh, quantitative work where possible. Um, but the, the one issue, we are talking about the future today. Yeah? And uh, I guess we don't have any data from the future. Uh, probably you agree. Um, and it, 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 uh, also if looking at big data, also in big data, uh, there is no data of the future. All the data we have is from the past. And um, this is fine in order to understand systems, to look for sensitivities, dependencies, and so on. But extending this knowledge to the future hmm, is a difficult issue. It is in epistemology, it's highly precarious. And we all know about the many experiences where our predictions failed, completely failed. Um, this is simply because humans uh, behave, sometimes behave different from the expectations. And this is our freedom, uh, this is our creativity. So um, sometimes people then start claiming that, um, well, in spite of all the data and models, we are not able to make good predictions. I'm happy about this. Mm -hmm. I'm happy that we cannot predict uh, in a very, very um, uh, certain way, because otherwise our life would be determined. Mm -hmm. We only can predict what has been determined today already, like um, uh, in the astronomy, for example. Um, humans are free, humans develop new things, humans are creative. Um, so and this makes um, predictions in the old fashioned sense of the 1960s and 70s, uh, renders this issue impossible. It's impossible possible for, for, uh, for human society. Well, but I understand, of course, that uh, managers do want to have the best predictions available <clears throat> whether a market success will be possible or not. Yeah, of course. Or, uh, yeah, and, and, and similar other things. Um, and for improving the possibility to do predictions as best as possible. So of course we need big data and artificial intelligence and algorithms and all these uh, issues. But we should not forget that they all operate on basis of past data. Mm -hmm. And um, in, uh, sometimes then when, this, when the time comes, also the surprise comes because the data from the past did not tell about the future what was expected. Uh, and I guess this is a kind of uh, conditio humana um, human condition, uh, condition humaine, which cannot be overcome because it's simply the other side of the coin of our freedom and creativity, which I like very much. Um, so we need, in addition to the database quantitative reasoning, we need qualitative reasoning. And uh, I just presented my basic argument because the missing data of the future um, and this is always a good, very simple, but good story to talk to uh, managers and uh, to enterprises because they really understand. Uh, and then the next step is to talk about qualitative reasoning, good arguments. And what I really like is to have good arguments in, um, the, in the way of developing scenarios for the future. Mm -hmm. So that means not predictions, but possible futures or more plausible futures, perhaps even probable futures. This is perhaps sometimes a bit difficult, but it's, uh, it, so if possible, it's, it's fine. And so in, in this type of thinking, the future is not just closed down to one prediction, but it's opened up. This fits very well to the title of your series. It's opened up to a variety of possible futures and then the enterprises can think, well, we have this range of possible futures 
And now we should develop our innovation, not only with respect to this one prediction, but to a broader range of possible futures, which needs some effort, mm -hmm. which needs perhaps more, um, more money than to um, close down to one possible future, but it increases the probability to really get return on investment. Okay. And how do you close, close it down to, if you have five possible futures, how do you close it down to two futures? Yeah, <laughs> if possible, again, by, um, by using uh, quantitative data and, and models, if possible. For example, in energy policy, we have huge models of the energy uh, market, of the energy supply system in Germany, Europe, and so on. And uh, we apply these models in order to get some insights about future development. Not in order to make a prediction, but we feed these models with different input data. For example, we assume different developments for the future in terms of policies. For example, the future, political future could become a more green one. Then there are par some parameters related to thinking green, and then we can run the model in this direction, or we can run the model in a more neoliberal um, uh, direction, or we can run the model into a more um, nationalistic uh, direction, you know, with cutting off world trade, uh, free trade, and so on. So this makes the range of possible futures um, clear. Um, if not possible, we can, we can simply talk with experts, but also with citizens, with stakeholders about plausible futures in a qualitative way. We can organize scenario workshops, for example, in order to think about the future of a specific region. We did, we did this for several regions in Europe. Uh, how do you see your future? You have this strength and this weaknesses, and then we can talk about where do we want to go? So this type of thinking has a it's not only um, explorative in the sense of data driven from the past, it's also normatively driven by thinking, where do we want to go to in the future? So we have different approaches in order to deal with this openness of future in order to, hmm, to close down this openness a bit. Uh, because if we take into account the full openness, we don't have any orientation what could be done. I feel like I can keep asking questions about um, the way your work, um, but I'm just conscious that I think our time is kind of nearly up. And so I want to get to my last question, which is about your career. So <laughs> you have been working in TA slash RI for a number of decades, if I can say that, <laughs> and including holding senior positions. And like I said before, when I introduced you, the head of um, the Office for TA Technology Investment at the German Bundespark since 2002, that's a long time. I assume that you would have had, have worked with many, on many projects. So I'm wondering what is something that you see, but most people often don't? Something that maybe everybody should know, should be aware of? <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. This is the, um, 100% question. Um, one, one, vision, one vision with respect to a very ugly problem we have in Germany and many other countries, high level radioactive waste. We had a very bad story in Germany over the last decades. And now I'm chair of a national committee to, uh, to, to observe and to take care of a new process of made a complete relaunch of the siting process to find a good place how to dispose and where to dispose high level nuclear waste. And my vision is that we will be able to manage this in a peaceful way. Uh, this would be very different to the past because in the past there were riots and so on, really complicated situations. In the future, I'm going for a new process with um, public participation, a highly transparent, science-based and peaceful. And um, I put my effort uh, that this will 
go forward. My concern uh, on the other side in a broader sense is that we, um, that we continuously are in risk to overlook the vulnerabilities of our modern societies. This was already my concern before the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, which uncovered a lot of our vulnerabilities. We did a study, for example, for the German Bundestag about 10 years ago about the vulnerability of the German um, electricity supply and possible consequences of a blackout. And this was a devastating result we got. Um, today, I look at the, uh, at the field of digitalization. We all are very happy about digital technologies and this is wonderful, even in particular in case of the pandemic. But we increase our dependency on these technologies day by day. Um, one example, if we go, if we would abolish the possibility to pay by cash, and indeed in some countries, we have already now difficulties to pay by cash, then this option paying by cash will disappear. In, ca in case that the um, internet would break down because of a war or some virus, some digital virus or whatever, then nobody could buy anything without cash. So uh, this is perhaps a simple example, but I'm afraid that we are running into many, many deep vulnerabilities by increasing our dependence on the functioning of all these digital technologies. And my, my concern is there's no plan B. What would we do in case of? Mm -hmm. And I will take my possibilities and opportunities to, to raise awareness and I will use the pandemics we experience now as an example, what could happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are in risk to think, well, everything is going wonderful. We have wonderful innovations, everything will be better and so on and so on. But there is something on the dark side of the, of, of, of the history of the development. And we should not forget about this. I was imagining um, what the world would be like without, well, without, the internet and for the younger generation, they wouldn't really know what the world would be like because they were born into the internet generation. But it is kind of a scary thought, isn't it? Yes. Because sometimes we, we think of country, for example, countries with um, still paying cash, we kind of think that, oh, that's because they're, they're behind. But at the same time, that's actually a, a plan B, like you said, that if something goes wrong, then they still, they can still operate without, um, totally being stopped. Um, yeah, yeah. So there are always good arguments to go for the digital technologies. Yeah, so it, I don't know, there's no necessity to tell about this, and this is fine. Uh, but there is another side, and this is an old experience of technology assessment, not only to look at the bright side of technology, but also to think about what could be happening in the background, which is not on our not on our um, not on our table so and we sometimes we have to to uncover what's going on mm. and to go for plans b yeah well thank you so much for your time like i said before i feel like i've just started to talk to you and reading through um your talks uh I, i've got quite a few more questions and hopefully we can have a chat in the future again so thank you so much for your time Thank you, Sharon. It was a pleasure.